thinking about learning programming is very daunting like a lot of people take architecture because they don't want to get into yeah. programming why is rhino being adopted it's being adopted because of its high fidelity and precise modeling capabilities is being adopted for its parametric modeling capabilities with grasshopper the soap bubble experiments that fry auto used to conduct to study forms and that would reflect in their architecture as well now this process when replicated digitally hey ever wondered how architects weave magic into their creations like these that you can see on the screen they do it by using the power of computational design well Today's your lucky day because we are about to unravel the mysteries of computational design with an extraordinary personality, architect Aman Jain. Having done his masters in computational design from IAAC Spain, he has had a fabulous career working with giants like Morphogenesis and Populous as a computational and generative designer. So buckle up guys and get ready for a journey that will ignite your imagination and redefine the way you perceive complex terms like parametric modeling and generative design. So let's dive in. Hello tribe and welcome to our channel. You know, as an architect myself, I love the design part. But when it comes to those tedious tasks like drafting and doing things over and over again, I wish someone could do it for me. But wait, not someone, but something can do it for me. and that something is computational design and to discuss more about this topic today we have a very special guest with us welcome aman jain an architect a computational designer and a course director at noveta with an experience of more than 10 years so without any further ado let's get started with the video and decode the abc's of computational design so aman in the course of my learning and understanding of the architecture curriculum during the 5 years I feel like after completing those 5 years learning programming becomes an added complexity to many architecture students and professionals post degree so how would you encourage them to approach this problem and understand the situation in a more better way and understanding programming in computational design okay that's a very valid question i faced the same dilemma when i was when i had graduated uh anyone who's trying to start learning how to program should firstly understand why they want to learn to program either they want to explore programming just as a general skill set or they have an end use in mind perhaps they are trying to achieve something which the tools in the software are not letting them achieve right. right once you have a clear agenda why you want to do it then your approach would be very structured but even then thinking about learning programming is very daunting right. like a lot of people take architecture because they don't want to get into yeah. programming right but uh, programming has advantages but to overcome the fear of learning programming i think a know what you need to do b get into a learning mindset so you need to be focused and you need to be you need to set a agenda for yourself and uh, stick to it right programming if you're learning there are many ways to do that you can learn it through books you can learn it through through some courses you can learn it through uh, some online resources as well I feel that the best way of learning programming is by doing something which gives you instant gratification, right? So when I started learning programming, hmm. I used to learn it on a interface or a platform called Processing or P5JS. It's a programming interface that helps you create drawings or graphics. So whatever code I would write, even a single line, it would result into some kind of graphics. Now. I was learning programming because the concepts are same all across. It's just the application was very relevant to my industry, which was design and architecture. And this process helped me learn programming, and then I was able to apply those basics even in computational design, in grasshopper, and beyond. So that could be one way of starting if you're a designer, so that you get instant gratification, and then you're able to learn but still have fun while learning. Right, makes sense. Yeah. Back in my graduation days, also uh, I remember being an architecture student, and uh, I was like really intimidated by software like Rhino and Grasshopper because of how complex they looked. So, uh, is there a way that you can help our viewers understand, elaborate, and break down the applications of Rhino and Grasshopper? So, there are many softwares that are used in architecture practices for different reasons. Right. Rhino is a 3D modeling software that has been adopted in architecture practices since the early 2000s. 
Now, why is Rhino being adopted? It's being adopted because of its high fidelity and precise modeling capabilities. It's being adopted for its parametric modeling capabilities with Grasshopper and the ease with which it integrates with all the other softwares, architectural softwares and integrates with other workflows. So these are the reasons why Rhino is adopted. Now, why should you or any young architect or any architect would want to learn Rhino and Grasshopper should be a reason which is very specific. If you have some constraints with the current tools that you're using, you're not able to maximize your creative potentials through those tools, then you may look into Rhino if it suits your requirement. Now, while trying to learn something and if it seems complicated, it's a fairly uh, common uh, issue that would resist someone from trying out or learning something new. So what you need to be clear about is the use case that will help you firstly start and sustain through learn phase of the, of the software, right? Also, while you're trying to adopt a new tool, you should start small. I see a lot of people because of the things that you can do with Rhino and Grasshopper would like to start with something which is very complicated, very complex. And in the beginning, it may seem easy, but as it starts building upon the complexities, uh, someone might get discouraged because it's getting out of their hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the other way to approach it would be start small, try and use this tool to do things that you were doing in your other tools. Get familiar with it, get familiar with the interface, uh, get a hang of the commands and once you're able to do the things that you were doing in the other softwares, then you can scale up to something which is complex. This way you will have a sense of achievement of, uh, of being able to create something and it will also give you this motivation to keep pushing forward. So that's how I see you can uh, try these new tools and not be scared of it. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but whenever I think about the word parametricism or parametric design, my mind just races to, you know, these complex structures or like the ones designed by Zaha Hadid or BIG, you know, all these structures. and. But now that I've you know grown out of it and learned new things about CD and everything, I know that there are subsets of further of CD like parametric, generative, biomimetic. So is there a way that you can help decode what are these subsets and what is the difference between all these uh, you know parts of CD? Sure. So let me start with parametric design. This parametric design simply refers to building relationships between uh, parameters and your design parameters, right? It's it's a rule-based system, which all designers and architects, they follow subconsciously. I'll give you an example. If you are starting off a design of a building on a plot, there are many ways to start. One way to start is looking at the development controls. Now, development controls are your maximum height, your ground coverage, the FSI that is permissible the site setbacks. Now, when you consider all these rules, you try to create an associative relation. For example, if you have a certain setback, you can only create certain amount of, uh, you can only cover certain amount of area on the ground. And if you want to achieve certain amount of FSI, you would then stack up that area into a number of flows to achieve that area. So it's all related. If you increase the height, you can have more FSI. If you decrease the height, you may want to increase the footprint to get more FSI. So when you set this up as a relation, it becomes a parametric model, which is mathematically driven with rules, our rules being these simple formulas and the result would be a form. So that's parametric modeling. I have very, I've simplified it for just a very, uh, uh, a very, uh, you know, basic use case. But once you, once you stack up these rules, it starts resulting in more complex geometries, which you see and you mentioned like Zaha Hadid and others, right? Now let's talk about generative design. You can think of it as a smart assistant for your creative process where a human might create one design at a time. You can use computational tools to generate and explore multiple design options. Okay. Now let me give you, give you an example for this. Mm -hmm. If we build on the previous example of the relationship between development controls of uh, setbacks, ground coverage, FSI, height, based on these rules, which are uh, usually governed by state authorities, you can create in numerous designs, in numerous building forms. 
then why does every designer make different fonts because everyone takes those rules and interprets it differently yeah. right so rather than you coming up with design options which you can do you can set up a parametric uh, model and you can ask the computer to iterate through multiple uh, parameters you can change the parameters like ground coverage building height and it will generate various form options for you you can also set some goals and constraints the goals would be to analyze the design that you are getting out of this exploration and trying to rank them which is performing the best which is uh, which is uh, not performing that well and through this rather than spending time creating one uh, all the options yourself you can ask the computer to generate or explore through thousands of options bring it down or filter it down to those certain options that you can choose from right this is called generative design optioneering this is where you're using generative design for creating options if you were to link generative design with performative aspects of the design let's say structural performance or energy performance then this could be considered as generative design optimization where the goal of this exploration is to optimize the result in the other case you were just exploring ideas where you get to choose from it right it is it is helpful to certain extent but it can never replace the complete end to end design process it will it will help you get the initial start and narrow down on the designs that you'd like to explore further right when you mentioned biomimetic biomimetic is a subset of computational design again where you are inspired by the natural processes and trying to mimic them through computational tools for example you must have heard of pioneers like uh, Fry Otto, uh, Antonio Gaudi, right. and Heinz Eiler. Yeah. These are pioneers who leveraged physical forms under natural forces like gravity. You would have heard of the hanging chain model yeah. by Gaudi, or the soap bubble experiments that Fry Otto used to conduct right. to study forms, and that would reflect in their architecture as well. Now, this process, when replicated digitally, when you're trying to simulate these forces. on geometries is called digital form finding and that can help you create novel forms which would otherwise be very difficult to conceive using normal modeling processes even in softwares like rhino hence the computational aspect uh, really comes into play when you're really letting the rules take over and setting up processes and let the process generate the form for you okay there are many more subsets to computational design But uh, I just spoke about the three, and uh, right. we can speak about the rest later. Okay, so thank you for narrowing down the subsets of computational design and helping all of us understand, uh, you know, all of it. Uh, but now, uh, when it, so I understood how computational design can be very efficient in problem solving uh, for buildings and design, but. do you think that there is a way when it comes to urban planning or city planning computational design can be as efficient as it is for buildings can you you know throw some light on that for our viewers to understand so you're right computational design is applied in urban uh, urban planning as well especially using the data analysis and data visualization uh, aspect within urban planning so you have a lot of data points in urban planning data points would be different land uses plot sizes proximity of the land uses right. urban density population density mm -hmm. you also have traffic flows yeah. you also have development controls now all these data points can become parameters in a parametric model and can be used to iterate through design options or planning options okay and this iteration will show you data and results real time okay right and you can analyze those results If you take it a step further, mm -hmm. you can link it up with generative design tools, and you can set some goals to test it against. Either you can use generative design to create multiple options mm -hmm. and sift through it manually, okay. or set goals to either reduce carbon emissions mm -hmm. or improve neighborhood design, okay. or ensure walkability between neighborhood based on proximity, or even optimize parking spaces. Mm -hmm. So all of these goals can be set as criteria. for the generative design tool to use as a benchmark to test the designs against or the urban plans against and that's how it can be very useful there are some platform generative design platforms like sidewalk labs 
then there is digital blue foam there is a smarter city by kpf which demonstrate how computation design can be used in urban design and analytics we fairly understood the you know the applications of computational design and how it can be used in buildings and urban planning and all of it but like for our viewers could you just elaborate it more with the help of an example or how computational design was used in building that particular form just a basic case study to just help us understand a bit more okay i think one good example would be museo somaya so when architect fernando romero if i am not mistaken uh was conceptualizing the design for it and had the initial idea he sought the help of gary tech gary technologies to help design and deliver the facade gary the, yes gary technologies is the company that he uh, sought uh, help from to design and deliver the hexagonal facade that is very iconic right. in our uh, industry so the process involved firstly analyzing the shape and the curvature of the facade you know because it's covered with a hexagonal pattern which is seamless right. so they had to come up with a way to create those patterns in a seamless manner onto the facade now due to the asymmetric distortion of the shape each of the 15000 panels varied in size and shape So computational tools along with mathematical and geometric logic was used to minimize the variation in panels. So rather than having 15000 different types of panels which would mean that each panel had to be uh cut differently, fabricated differently, then installation the substructure would be different. So that's a lot of variations. So they came up they came up with logic to reduce it to 52 types that would cover 80% of the facade. and then remaining 20% were uh, unique ones but it still resulted in a lot of optimization that would save cost time as well as constructional com- uh, complications computational tools were also deployed to design the substructure that would hold these panels in place so the entire framework the nodes the tagging of the nodes it was used to create a smart labeling system for these substructure members to ease the construction process now looking at the number of panels that you have mm-hmm. and the shape and because everything is bespoke it would otherwise be very difficult or nearly impossible right. to do this without computational tools right thank you aman that was a really insightful conversation and there you have it folks another mind blowing episode in the books of novata thanks to the incredible insights shared by architect aman jain i don't know about you but i am feeling inspired to explore the endless possibilities of computational design if you loved today's episode as much as i did don't forget to smash that like button share it with your ac folks and hit the subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating content like these and conversations see you in the next one tribe until then let's dare to disrupt